morning, everybody. Uh, perhaps we can start this uh, session, uh, even if we have uh, not yet our last speaker, but I uh, <laughs> hope he will arrive. Uh, I'm really happy to welcome you uh, to this session. My name is uh, Alexandra Aubry, and I am a professor in medical uh, microbiology, and I also work at the French National Return Center for TB, uh, with my co-chair, uh, who is uh, a pneumologist and also a brilliant uh, mycobacteriologist uh, who is in charge uh, uh, of the uh, National Reference Center uh, for TB in France. Uh, so uh, we hope we enjoy, you enjoy uh, French accent and uh, more seriously, uh, uh, yes, yeah, you can see it. Um, we, we want to uh, share some data uh, uh, we do about uh, resistance. You, you hear about <coughs> a lot of that uh, resistance uh, 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 since two, day, two days. And uh, uh, today uh, we want to uh, share with you concerns regarding the difficulties to diagnose a low level of resistance in the lab and also uh, the opportunities those low levels uh, of resistance give us or not. Uh, to keep uh, uh, more drugs available for uh, MDR and XDR TB treatment. Uh, so, uh, Nicolas will uh, start uh, by uh, redefining breakpoints for M tuberculosis drug resistance. So that's, so thank you for the organizers for uh, uh, inviting me. Uh, it's a very cozy room. Um, um, so uh, I think there are microbiologists in the, in the room, so they know pretty well there's questions, but maybe there's problems which we see every day in the microbiology lab are uh, maybe not known from clinicians. So that's the <coughs> idea. I mean, the test we use they're really good to differentiate most of the white type and the resistant strains but for, for some strains there are problems and that's the idea today to show you those issues uh, so I do not have any conflict of interest uh, so I will first take you for a, a travel back in time uh, in 1963 so uh, that's uh, George Kennedy and when he uh, first published um, his, uh, his work uh, on the, the proportion method. So actually that was in a French journal. And uh, um, so I will show you some um, extracts of this, uh, this paper. And uh, so pretty easy for me, it's uh, written in French. And uh, so one of the sentences you see there <coughs> saying that the critical concentration must be low enough not to miss low level resistance and high enough not to be influenced by variations in antibiotic concentration. The main thing I want to underline here is that uh, they decided at that moment to have just one uh, critical concentration. And uh, of course, uh, having taken uh, this uh, decision, okay, okay. Sit, it's, not, it's not important. Sit. Uh, having taken this decision, of course, they would split the world in susceptible and resistant. So they knew there was uh, that would be a problem, and you can read here in bold what they wrote. Fixing drug resistance criteria at a high level opens the possibility that some resistant strains, low level ones, be classified as susceptible. So that's 1963, and they already knew that there would be some uh, uh, some issues. But uh, that was a deliberate choice, and they write this sentence here. It is a better choice to keep for isoniazid high resistance criteria so that the use of this admirable drug uh, is never stopped too early. Uh, so that was the paper by Kennedy. The same year there was an international meeting uh, where uh, they kept the definitions uh, uh, um, 
uh, that were used by Kennedy, which are based on uh, laboratory response. And yeah, okay, <laughs> come and sit here. It's definitely a too small room, <laughs> but we did not choose the room. <laughs> um, so it's based on laboratory resistance, but it, it does not mean uh, uh, full clinical resistance. And uh, it's we're still in 1963. Eh? They write that uh, full quantitative testing is preferred, but may be dif difficult to implement in routine. And we're 50 years later, and we're more or less at the same point. Um, so that's one, one aspect of uh, the problem. Some low-level resistance strains may be classified as susceptible. Um, but another issue, and uh, that's what I show you here, is that we may miss, that we may, uh, oopla, we may classify it as resistant some strains that can still be treated. And an easy way to understand that is to compare uh, here the, uh, the critical concentration used for classifying a strain as resistant. So when you're above this concentration, you are uh, resistant to the peak serum level. And for example, here it's the injectables. The critical concentration is around one milligrams per liter, more or less. And the peak serum level, when you use amication or canamycin, it's between 40 and 80 milligrams per liter, depending on the dosing you used. And so, of course, when you see that, you say maybe there are some mutants classified as resistant, but for which the MIC would be still below the peak serum level, and you can still have some activity. And th so that's the example of the injectables. So the answer is yes, some of these mutants do exist. So you here you have the distribution for um, amicacin, canamycin, and um, capromycin of the susceptible and the mutants. As what you can see here is that for these mutants, some of these have an MIC that is below the peak serum level. So you'd expect some in vivo uh, activity. So to which extent this activity? We do not have the answer for um, all the drugs. But still, that underlines the fact that having a um, uh, black and white definition, susceptible or resistant, of course, does not reflect the reality. And when you look at what UCAST uses for other bugs like uh, staphylococci or whatever, of course there is a susceptible and resistant category, but there is also an intermediate category. And this category is defined uh, this way. Uh, it implies that an infection due to the isolate, uh, isolate may be appropriately treated in body sites where the drugs are physio physiologically concentrated, or, and that's more interesting for us, when a high dosage of drug can be used, it also indicates a buffer zone that should prevent small and controlled technical factors from causing major discrepancies in interpretations. And so I will give you two examples now uh, which illustrate that we have these problems uh, uh, in TB. So um, that's what I call the, the two sides of the same coin of this various levels of resistance. And the first, which I call here the dark side, is the reduced activity when you, uh, uh, you miss the, uh, the low level resistance. And that's to, to link with the title of the session, that's what we, I would call the challenge for the, the lab. And I mean, all the people that do drug susceptibility testing for a terminal know that very well. Uh, when you use a uh, midget, so that's what uh, is done here in this paper in PLOS one, and they test in midget 32 ethambital resistant strains. They all have mutations in the uh, uh, EMBB gene, which is well known for uh, giving resistance to ethambital. And when they test the strains with the recommended uh, critical concentrations, five milligrams per liter, half of them are classified resistant and half of them are classified susceptible. And when they measure precisely the MIC of these resistant strains, all of the strains have an MIC which is uh, almost the same as the critical concentration. So of course, you imagine very well that some are tested resistant, some are tested susceptible. When you test in solid media, and that's an in-house work done by uh, um, uh, Alexandra Aubry, our chairman, and uh, that's 57 <coughs> strains with EMBB mutations, and uh, these strains were tested in our lab in uh, Lovenstein and Jensen, two milligrams per liter, that's the critical concentration, either with a commercial test, that's the one we can buy in France, or in an uh, in-house test. We do prepare our, ourselves our Lovenstein and Jensen's. And what you see is that first here, seven strains that, were, that had mutations were classified susceptible 
by both of the, uh, the tests. And here, 17 were classified susceptible with our in-house test and resistant with a uh, commercial test. So obviously, these uh, low-level resistant mutants are poorly detected by phenotypic tests. But of course, of course, the question that comes ne next is, yeah, maybe they are not well detected, but maybe they do not have an, any impact on, on treatment, and you should not detect them. So maybe, but there are some uh, arguments saying that they do have an impact, and there is this paper. Uh, uh, in this paper, they uh, constructed uh, uh, EMBB mutants of H H H H H37RV, sorry, and they infected mice and treated mice with uh, ethambutol. Uh, of course, and you have here the susceptible strain and here the, uh, the mutant strain. And the, this, this strain has a 4 mg per liter MIC, so the one that is just close to the critical concentration. And so I won't enter in the details of this paper, but it shows that in vivo, in a marine model, there is some decreased activity of the antibiotic, which makes <coughs> sense. I mean, the MIC is higher. Um, so low level resistance, even very low level resistance, I would say, has an impact uh, on treatment efficacy, even when it's not well detected by uh, um, uh, phenotypic test. And finally, to finish with ethnomital, uh, probably the explanation and the, I mean, the solution comes from, uh, it's suggested here by works from uh, uh, Thomas Schoen. <coughs> you have here the distribution of the MICs of the susceptible strains, and here the, uh, the distribution of the MIC of the resistant strains. And what you see here is that at the 4 mg per liter MIC, you have an overlap between resistant, at least mutated strain and white type strains in EMBB. And uh, strains having an MIC below 2 mg, up to 2 mg per liter, do not have any mutation in EMBB. 8 mg per liter and above, they all have mutations. And in the 4 mg per liter MIC, uh, some have mutations, some do not have. So probably this 4 mg per liter category should not fall in susceptible or resistant, but probably an intermediate category in which it's difficult to state if they are wild type uh, or not. So that's the first uh, uh, example of rethinking our, our breakpoints. As some we told, the MICs of the mutants are close to the ones of the wild type strains. Uh, the creation of an intermediate category would reflect the uncertainties of phenotypic DST. And of course, we have now genotypic DST, and on this particular point, it's probably better than the uh, phenotypic DST. And I will finish uh, on a thumb told with this very interesting uh, thing. That's uh, 1969. Uh, that was the second international consensus on uh, drug resistance and um, how to test. Uh, and I read you the, sen the sentence for a thrombital, the in vitro difference between sensitive and resistant strains is very small. There is evidence that in vitro resistance to a thrombital is often difficult to detect in cases of apparent clinical resistance. So there's nothing new. I mean, all that was very well known 50 years ago. So that was for the challenge for the lab. And then I will move to the other aspect, and we'll, we'll hear more about that in the, um, in the following uh, speaks what I call the bright side is the fact you have low level resistance and you can still use a drug to, to treat uh, um, in case of low level resistance. And of course, the first drug, the, the most well known drug for that is isoniazid. I mean, everybody knows that there are low and high level resistance strains. This is again pretty well shown here by uh, a paper by Thomas Schoen. So you have here the susceptible strains and here the resistant ones. And as you see, there is a very wide distribution of uh, uh, MICs. And when you look at the isoniazid uh, <coughs> pixerm level, uh, you see that for some strains, I mean, almost half of these mutants, they have MIC below the pixerm level. So of course, INH may still be active against some uh, low-level resistant mutants. If we go in a little bit in more details, and probably most of you know that, uh, most of the high-level resistant mutants are the ones that have mutations in KG. And most of the low-level resistant mutants are uh, um, the ones that have mutations in the promoter region of the INH uh, um, gene. And uh, of course, that's not comp very. Uh, th there are some overlaps, but still, that's that's uh, generally true. 
What is probably a concern is the phenotypic tests, and I just show you here the, <coughs> the, the, mo the two most used ones, the midget and the Lovesh and Jensen. You see that you have two critical concentrations in midget. In the, in the Lovesh and Jensen we use in France, we have three, and <coughs> they are not the same. So, I mean, depending on the test you use, probably you do not, when what you will call a low level or high level resistance strain is not the same thing. So. There are some, uh, some problems there. Okay, so let's accept that there are some low level resistance strains. So, can we treat the strains and have a benefit for the patient? So, that would justify to identify the strains. Uh, first paper, <coughs> this, that's, so that's a clinical paper from Chen. They, they treat um, uh, isonized resistance uh, patients. And you have here on the left the w patients that have low level resistance strains and on the right high level resistance strains they say that they use both midget and uh, Lovensch and Jensen but the critical concentrations they, they indicated more fits with uh, Lovensch and Jensen so I assume they, they use Lovensch for their definitions uh, so it's probably uh, not very important but still in their paper no difference between high and low level resistance whether you put or not isoniazid has no impact. So that was not in favor of in vivo activity of isoniazid against low level resistance strains, but that was at a normal dosage of isoniazid, no increased uh, dosing of isoniazid. Uh, so is there a benefit of increasing the dosing of uh, isoniazid? <coughs> so that's a modeling paper. Um, so this team, it's a, it's a French team. Uh, uh, they modeled uh, EBA, early bacteriacidal activity. On the left, you have the slow acetylators. On the right, the fast acetyl acetylators. Here, uh, you see the, MIC, the increasing MICs of uh, isoniazid, and of course, the decreasing uh, uh, EBA with increasing MIC. And so, what they do show in their uh, model is that when you increase uh, isoniazid dosing up to 900 milligrams, so three times the usual dosing, you uh, somehow restore activity you lose with the increasing MIC. It's not complete restoration, but you gain some activity you've lost with uh, uh, increasing resistance. So if you um, believe this model, there should be a benefit of increasing uh, uh, dosing against this uh, low level resistance strains. <coughs> and so is it true in patients? So I found one paper um, uh, when I prepared this, this peak. So that's in India, uh, 123 patients, they were all MDR, and uh, you see here the MICs, uh, so the breakpoints are again different, so what you call a low and high level resistance. Uh, so there are different uh, various levels of drug resistance. And for those MDR patients, they did three groups. The first group here, group one, received 16 to 18 milligrams per kilo isoniazid. <coughs> so that's a very large dosing. The second group received standard dosing, five milligrams per kilo, and the, whoop, 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 sorry. And the last group did not receive uh, um, uh, isoniazid. And uh, what they do show, that's here, this column here, is the uh, median time to counter conversion is three months when you give high dosing of isoniazid and six months in the two other groups. So it shows you a benefit in terms of speed of conversion, but at the end there is no difference. I mean, the proportion of people that converted is the same in the three groups, but they uh, convert faster. It also confirms that normal dosing does not prov uh, provide any benefit. And although it's not the, the aim of this talk, I, I want to show you that there were a lot of uh, peripheral uh, neuropathies in the high dosing group. So that's also something you have to, to put in balance, of course. Um, so uh, that's my uh, almost last slide. So my conclusion on isoniazid. You have different levels of operations, that's clear. Some mutants have an elevated MIC that is be below the pixel level. Modeling and uh, clinical data suggest that higher dosing may have activity. But then if I want to go further and say, OK, what is the definition of this strain that can be treated? What is the dosing? I think we're <laughs> a little bit limited and I am really surprised that 50 years after the first description we still don't know exactly what to do with this low level resistance strain. So uh, as we say usually when we finish our papers, additional works are needed. 
in order to identify strains that can still be treated, but that's really surprising. I mean, we're 50 years ago, huh? 50 years after the, the first description, and we probably need an intermediate category rather than low-level resistance, keeping this high definition, but that probably needs more work, and I'm still not sure about what is exactly an intermediate strain for isoniazid. So my general conclusion uh, would be this one. So mutations that do generate various levels of uh, drug resistance, the current critical concentration, okay, they are good. They do distinguish the most common resistance <coughs> strains and uh, uh, the wild type strains, so they're good. But they do not detect some low level resistance strains and they do not uh, um, distinguish low and high level resistance that is clinically meaningful because at the end that's, that's what we want. Uh, so we probably need an um, uh, intermediate category <coughs> for some <coughs> antibiotics, not sure for all, but some for some of these. And what is sure is that we need to go from black and white to uh, shades of gray. So of course when you try in Google image to find shades of gray, you find this image, 50 <laughs> shades of gray. So probably not 50, but we need to have some more complex idea of resistance. Thank you. We have time only for uh, one or two questions, uh, but since the uh, room is not needed at the end, I propose you to stay a little bit more uh, at the end of the session. So, one or two questions? No? So, Nicolas, yes? So, in cases where you can clearly see overlap between wild type strains and strains that have resistance mutations. Would it not make sense in those cases to introduce expert rules to say if you find a mutation, so the rule is susceptible uh, result in cases where there's no evidence that increased dosing could be used to make to treat those strains? So what you say is the phenotypic test is susceptible. <coughs> I find a mutation. Yes, and it's a mutation where we know that the, that the yeah, and I still use the drug. No, what, what I'm saying is, so let's say, let's use the example of You have clearly have an overlap of yeah. three or six mutations, and there's, as far as I know, not good evidence that these are still treatable. So yeah. should we not be saying, because it, should the genotype not overrule the phenotype in those cases? Because if you were to retest the same strain multiple times, it'll likely flip flop between its susceptible and disease. Yeah, so after, because probably this is important for MDR <coughs> patients. When you, that's, I mean, we, we talk about MDR when they have a lot of drug, a lot of toxicities, and I think probably the decision is, uh, um, has to take into account the toxicity and the number of drugs. As for myself, and I use to say that the gold standard is a phenotype, and that, I mean, years ago I was always, my final conclusion was based on phenotype. But when I discover the problem that we will hear after about the low-level reef resistance that are not very well detected, and we'll hear more about that after. <laughs> I must say now that I make some three-line conclusion explaining that I have discrepancies, and I show both, both results, and that we're really not sure about the in vivo activity, and then when we do the TB continuum and we decide about the drugs, the <coughs> I, I must say that it really depends on the number of drugs and toxicity expected, and okay, is it a risk for the patient or not? And we more decide uh, this way, individualized way. Okay, so I will introduce uh, so <laughs> our chairman as speaker. So uh, um, Alexandra Aubry, so which will uh, uh, has done a lot of work on uh, uh, fluoroquinolone uh, diagnosis and of on different levels of resistance. So she will show us uh, the challenges and uh, the opportunities again. There's. Uh, with this lens. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, okay. 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 <laughs> so uh, let's talk about uh, quinolone. Uh, quinolone, as you know, are amazing drug uh, against, uh, very efficient against MDRTB, has illustrated by those Kaplan Myers curves. Uh, you know that uh, the bad prognosis of uh, AXDR-TB is mainly due to uh, fluoroquinolone resistance rather than to aminoglycosate resistance. And those very important drugs are part, oops, sorry, 
are part of the uh, shorter MDR-TB regimen now approved by the WHO. One important recommendation is to check uh, the susceptibility to quinoline uh, before starting the treatment. Uh, when, why uh, uh, does this uh, recommendation exist? Uh, as uh, you can see uh, in this table, uh, where you have the uh, treatment success uh, uh, of a patient treated with a shorter MDR-TB regimen versus the conventional uh, MDR-TB uh, regimen uh, based on the resistant pattern to pyrazinamide and fluoroquinolone, <coughs> uh, the patients uh, who are infected by strain resistant to uh, fluoroquinolone have always a uh, 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 less better outcome uh, than uh, uh, those with uh, strains even uh, just resistant to pyrazinamide. So it's very important to check this uh, resistance. Uh, the uh, method uh, who has been approved, which has been approved recently <coughs> by the WHO to uh, check this is an LPA uh, essay, MTBDR SL uh, test. And what WHO says is while resistance conferring mutation to fluoroquinolone detected by this test are highly correlated with phenotypic resistance to OFLO and LIVO, the correlation with MOXIE and GATI is less clear. And the inclusion of MOXIE and GATI in an MDR-TB regimen, shorter or conventional, is best guided by phenotypic DST results. Uh, we have a common expression in English and French, and you know that devil is in the detail. And there are two important details. Uh, one is <coughs> which threshold used to classify a strain as susceptible or resistant to quinoline. And the other one is which uh, dosage should we uh, uh, prescribe to our patient, high or normal uh, dosage. So Nicolas explained you uh, very well this black and white vision we have in uh, uh, drug susceptibility testing in TB. Uh, classically, uh, fluoroquinolone resistance is defined by the uh, ability of the strain to grow on a medium containing 2 mg per liter of ofloxacin. But since a uh, lot of data have shown that among ofloxacin resistant strains, later generation fluoroquinolone Levo, Moxie, and GATI MICs are lower and even lower than the peak serum level. Um, WHO finally proposed two critical concentrations, but only for Levo and Moxie in some media, to be able to distinguish with high and low level of resistance. And this has some relevance has shown in this study uh, performed uh, through uh, six different countries. Uh, as you can see, among ofloxacin resistant strains, 28% uh, are still susceptible to MOXIE, 65 have a low level of resistance to MOXIE, and only 7 are highly resistant to MOXIE. So if uh, we uh, would respect uh, the recommendation, the first recommendation uh, of the use of drugs in TB, we would throw every uh, uh, drug when a uh, level of resistance is detected. We do not this for <laughs> quinoline uh, because uh, <laughs> in fact we have not plenty uh, drug available to treat MDR and XDR TB. So WHO strangely recommends to uh, use later generation fluoroquinolones uh, to treat MDR TB resistant to ofloxacin. So why this strange recommendation? The uh, first uh, uh, argument uh, um, uh, supporting this uh, came from this uh, review and meta-analysis, uh, which uh, provides the first evidence that uh, uh, empirical, uh, the first empirical evidence that the use of uh, later generation fluoroquinolone for the treatment of XDR uh, TB significantly improves. Uh, treatment outcomes. But we have to find some more uh, uh, data to support this. Uh, there are some in vivo data. Uh, we performed a first experiment in the lab by infecting uh, uh, mice 
with uh, strains which are susceptible to uh, uh, quinolone and also uh, isogenic mutants are growing uh, DNA gyrase mutation. Uh, you know that uh, gyrase mutation are the main uh, mechanism of fluoroquinolone resistance in clinical strains. And uh, we infected mice with the two most uh, a frequent uh, mutant found in uh, clinical strains and also with one mutant uh, which are more rare and uh, which is implicated in a lower level of resistance. <coughs> All of those three strains are resistant to quinolone and only one of them are highly resistant <coughs> to moxifloxacin. So let's uh, see the CFU results. Um, has shown here, you see that uh, there, uh, the activity is maintained against low level uh, resistance strains, uh, but only uh, at double dosage, which is in favor uh, of the uh, WHO recommendation and also of critical concentration, allowing differentiation between low and high level resistance. But TB should be treated by a combination of drugs. So what happens when uh, uh, we uh, uh, tested this <coughs> in a model where we use a combination of drugs, a classical combination used to treat uh, MDR-TB patients. Uh, this time we treated uh, mice for six months and kept them uh, untreated for uh, um, three more months to evaluate the sterilizing activity of uh, these uh, regimens. And uh, what we show is a nice correlation with resistance level despite small MIC's differences. But we are not mice, so uh, what uh, kind of data can we found uh, in the literature uh, for humans? There are four publications. For uh, uh, two of them uh, uh, um, <coughs> uh, concern patients treated by gatifloxacin, and the two others, uh, one for, uh, by uh, MOXI and the uh, last one by uh, any of the uh, uh, later generation for quinolone. I put this box in each slide to show you uh, which uh, definition was used to uh, say that the strain is resistant to quinolone and usually it's the fluxacin 2 mg per, uh, per milliliter uh, medium and also uh, which uh, critical concentration are used to classify the strains as susceptible, low level resistance or high level resistance to the later generation uh, quinolone used for the treatment. And finally, I indicate you uh, the dosage of uh, the later quinolone uh, uh, used for the treatment. So the first uh, study uh, concern the Bangladesh regimen. I will not uh, explain again uh, which drugs are part of this regimen. Uh, the first uh, study concerns uh, 515 patients. Among them, uh, 62 uh, were infected by strain resistance to afloxacin. The overall uh, outcome were uh, very good, uh, 84.5. So let's see if uh, this uh, different level of resistance to GATI has an impact on this outcome? The answer is yes. Uh, you see that uh, uh, patients infected by strains with a high level resistance to gatifloxacin have uh, a, a, a very low uh, a good outcome comparing to those infected by uh, strains fully susceptible uh, to gatifloxacin <coughs> or with a low level of resistance to gatifloxacin. So this really confirms a uh, murine model. Uh, the, uh, the next uh, uh, is the, uh, the, the uh, um, more recent uh, paper. Uh, we uh, have now uh, 181 patients uh, um, which uh, has been treated by this Bangladesh regimen. Uh, uh, and uh, who are infected by an ofloxacin resistant strains. And exactly the same observation uh, uh, is uh, 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 made with uh, this publication with, as you can see, a tremendous drop in the proportion cure to 50% or below starts from a gatifloxacin MIC of 2 mg per liter. 
So let's move now uh, to uh, different uh, publication study uh, made in Taiwan. Um, uh, the patients were treated by moxifloxacin. Uh, it was a conventional MDR-TB regimen and probably the dose was a normal one, even if it's not precise in the paper. Uh, patients were treated by moxifloxacin and exactly the same than with gatifloxacin is observed. Uh, with a better outcome uh, among patients treated by moxifloxacin uh, uh, which were uh, susceptible to moxifloxacin and has shown here oops, sorry, uh, the benefit to add moxifloxacin in the treatment of the patients uh, decrease uh, when the MIC to gatifloxacin increase and at the end uh, when the MIC is above 2 mg per liter, there were no more benefits to add moxifloxacin in the treatment. The last study, uh, and probably the, 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 the one um, where the, the most of limitation exists, for example, uh, um, uh, uh, all any of the uh, three later generation uh, quinolone were used, uh, among those uh, uh, 60 patients infected with uh, nofloxacin uh, resistant MDR TB strain, and uh, we don't know uh, which uh, uh, patients among the uh, uh, the one treated um, in the moxifloxacin susceptible or resistant group uh, finally received moxi levo or gatifloxacin. Uh, those groups, sorry. Uh, didn't differ uh, in terms of baseline characteristic or uh, the number of total or TB active drugs including linhezolid or surgery and exactly the same is observed than in the previous uh, studies uh, with uh, a much higher uh, treatment <coughs> failure rate in the among the uh, uh, moxifloxacin resistant group and a much and significantly higher rate of uh, treatment success uh, among the uh, uh, moxifloxacin susceptible group. So, what can we conclude? Yes, later generation fluoroquinolone can be efficient in case of flow resistance, especially at double dosage. But we still don't know if all the later generation fluoroquinolone, Nevo, Gatti, and Moxi are equivalent and uh, Nicolas uh, um, uh, uh, shows us some uh, uh, unpublished yet uh, data uh, two days ago uh, suggesting that LIVO is not equivalent at all to GATI and MOXI and we also need more data regarding the tolerability of those uh, double dosage. Of course, uh, as said previously, we need more data correlating susceptibility levels and clinical outcomes and we need to see, to stop to see the world into uh, uh, a black and white manner and to uh, uh, define at uh, uh, which, uh, in which case uh, fluoroquinolone are inefficient, in which case they are still efficient but at double dosage, and uh, in which case they are efficient but at normal dosage. So we need to uh, define uh, critical concentration probably has it is done for other bacteria and I just remind you because I am a, a classical microbiologist uh, as well and you know that for another bacteria <coughs> strep pneumonia uh, which is also responsible for pneumonia uh, UCAST uh, proposed to classify the strain uh, as susceptible or not uh, 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 taking into account the MIC and uh, the dosage which is used to treat the patient. So probably we have to do something very similar for TB. And finally we need to improve our knowledge about the correlation of DST genotypic methods and proquinolone MICs. Uh, many people in this room have done uh, a, a lot of work uh, and of course we know uh, uh, um, quite well the correlation for the uh, most prevalent uh, mutations but a lot of work is still needed and what we finally uh, would like to have is a manual 
describing how to use every genotypic method to choose later generation for quinoline dosage. And this is just a proposition. <laughs> it's not something that has to do, uh, but uh, uh, still, I, I, I probably, uh, it's probably uh, uh, the future. So thank you, and I'm happy to take <laughs> So the speak is open for discussion <laughs> and questions. And yeah. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, my problem would be, in the case of penicillin, we can just, you know, triple fold or tenfold yes. the dosage. It has a very wide um, uh, window, <coughs> um, therapeutic window. Mm. And for moxifloxacin, for instance, we know it's a, it's a problem with QT um, elongation and if you increase the dosage we've tried that a bit <coughs> but the, the trial actually uh, was flawed by the fact that we were stopped by the <coughs> cardiologist that we couldn't move on and increase the dosage yes you, you're right but we, we have two uh, uh, later generation trochronon which are uh, uh, microbiological you know microbiological point of view equivalent Gatti and Moxi. Uh, both have uh, uh, side effects, not the same. So perhaps we have to perform more data to really show that they are equivalent and to be able to choose in which patient one is better because of, uh, uh, for example, the dysglycemia problem is not an issue and uh, for others the uh, cardiotoxicity is not really an issue. And I'm always not very comfortable with this cardiotoxic uh, um, side effect because uh, we, we speak uh, about something we, we, we don't exactly know if it's really clinically <laughs> a problem. You're it's a little right. bit provocative to say that, yeah. but uh, patients just die. <laughs> uh, so um, to avoid the use of um, uh, for drug just because the QT is prolonged, I'm not sure that it's always the best we can do for the patient. But yeah, yeah, on the right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Great presentation again. Uh, my name is Kulik and the Maybe one of the problems could lie in the fact that we're using critical concentration. Yeah. Be using it probably for too long. Uh, referring to other drugs, they're using straight MIC. It's much easier to do an intermediate susceptible if you are doing MIC. I don't know how you do that when you're using critical concentration. So we've seen some of the gap is like between four or five dilution ranges. It's kind of difficult. In the lab, uh, the, the, the current methods we have uh, doesn't allow to measure a precise MIC. So, <laughs> and it's uh, more complicated and more, uh, we need more people to do it. So, uh, it's not possible uh, right now. So, we have to, uh, um, we have to change, a l to change a lot of, <laughs> of things to be able to do this. And things are changing because you see WHO now propose two different critical concentrations and probably two concentration are enough to uh, distinguish the strains which are really susceptible, the one intermediate, <laughs> and the one uh, for which uh, <coughs> adding Moxie or Gatti is really not uh, useful. So, but we have to perform two. Or more. Or more, but two at least. But if you could be better than one. <laughs> use an absolute concentration method on three or four levels, we could even reduce and uh, 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 maintain efficacy and reduce to toxicity. Yes. That would also, you know, be important. Okay, one last question. Yes, Pepe Caminero from the Union. Uh, at the moment, most of the countries are using <coughs> the standardized secondary regimen levofloxacin, high dosing levofloxacin. Mm -hmm. This is the situation. The patient failing to this regimen, usually they have levofloxacin resistance. What is the correlative? Uh, 
you, you told at the end, but do you have any data? What is the growth rate that meet with levoflux as a dosis <laughs> and high dosis moxie? Because our question is, this patient, they are FDR, but some of the patients probably, and sometimes in the laboratory, can say you, is susceptible to moxiprocessing. Can <coughs> work moxiprocessing because remember, after two, three years ago, we were thinking probably the chlorhexamine to level and moxi should be total. But probably not total. What is your opinion? Uh, I, I have two comments. Uh, the, the first is, you know, to, to treat pyelonephritis, uh, for a gram negative, we use the most active, the recommendation are to use the most active drug, quinolone. So it's Cipro. So why not to, <laughs> to do the same uh, for TB and always choose to uh, treat with the most active quinolone? So now we need data to prove that all those three later generation quinolone are all not equivalent. And you see, we have to uh, send to, to submit <laughs> our paper. <laughs> so I hope that soon uh, you will have some marine data um, we, we perform that really show uh, quite nicely, I'm afraid, that LIVO is uh, inferior to MOXIE uh, uh, for those uh, uh, low level resistance strains. But you have not data between LIVO and MOXIE processing growth resistance? We have mirroring data, yes. but not yet published, but soon, <laughs> I hope. Okay, so maybe we introduce the Yes. Oui, 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 alors à So is it okay? Yes. So I'm glad <coughs> to introduce Professor uh, Bauk de Jong, uh, uh, who is the uh, head of the Microbacteriology Laboratory at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, in Belgium. And uh, she was and is uh, involved in many studies evaluating drug susceptibility testing methods, resistance, and also clinical trials. So uh, she uh, will uh, speak uh, about detecting recently low le uh, level resistance, a challenge for the laboratory. Thank, Thank you very much, um, Alexandra. I'm very sorry that uh, Armand van Deun was not able to give this presentation himself. So I will present uh, our findings on the complexities of rifampicin resistance testing in Antwerp. And a little bit of background. Uh, every year we send around blinded strains to 30 supranational <coughs> reference laboratories, about 30 strains each time. And then they give us back our results as a form of uh, external quality assurance. And it was in the context of these EQA rounds that we noticed a problem with certain strains for which uh, these 30 uh, worldwide labs could not agree on whether they were resistant or sensitive. And because the interpretation of these EQA rounds is based on the judicial result, so we say the uh, if more than 80% of the labs agree on a strain being rifampicin susceptible or resistant, that will be the final gold standard. But for these strains where the labs could not agree, they were excluded from the analysis, and then we lost discriminatory power for the interpretation of performance for rifampicin testing. So we did some initial investigations, uh, excluded that these were strain mixtures that led to the problems, and then we found that it was specific mutations that led to these discrepancies. So for uh, about seven years <coughs> worth of data of these rounds, you can see that each dot is the average reported by all these 30 labs uh, in a particular year. And at the bottom you see the different mutations. So you see on the right the mutations where there is very high agreement. The 531 mutation is one of the known high confidence resistance mutations that causes a lot of MDR-TB. But on the left you see the mutations that are problematic where there's very low agreement. So the 533 proline, the uh, 516 tyrosine, and there's a bunch of others. What we next did is we <coughs> composed the panel of these uh, bacteria with mutations on which there was poor agreement and asked 10 of these supranational reference labs 
Can you test them with whatever method that you choose, what you do in the routine, and let us know whether they test sensitive or resistant? I am sorry that I cannot point out uh, with a pointer. It doesn't show. It doesn't show. Okay. Um, but let me um, guide you a little bit. On the right, there's the strains that were wild type, and you can see. Sorry, let me start with the, the y-axis. It's the ratio of the MIC to the critical concentration. And this is represented this way, as Alexandra said, uh, for different testing media, the critical concentration is different. So uh, essentially, if a strain is sensitive, you expect a value less than one. And if it's found resistant, it should be above one. And you can see that for the wild types on the right, there was high agreement, they were all sensitive. And then for some of the mutations, uh, all the results were resistance. The, again, the, uh, the 531 all the way on the left. If you look at the different testing methods, the LJ proportion method, the <coughs> one described by Canetti 50 years ago that Nicholas highlighted, agar proportion method uh, is the same uh, basis. Then the Bechtec radiometric liquid culture system and the Midget 960 that is now most commonly used. Uh, you can see that for the, the mutations in the middle, there was quite some disagreement where LJ proportion method would most likely recognize them as resistant, agar proportion was variable, and both the Bechtec radiometric system and the midget recognized these as susceptible. Uh, this is another way of showing that in um, Lowenstein-Jensen proportion method with readout at six weeks, and four weeks, uh, you can see the cumulative percentage of resistance. So the in red are the sensitive strains. They are cumulative recognized as susceptible quite rapidly. <coughs> On the blue is the resistance strains, and the dashed line shows at four weeks, a whole bunch of those are still considered susceptible. But if you give them more time, they will be recognized as resistant. So the conclusion is that rifampicin still has some activity on these slower growing strains, but you need to give them sufficient time to declare themselves as resistant. So a little bit more work we've done on uh, rapid DST methods for these difficult mutations, and Gabriela Torreya uh, presented an oral presentation on some of this work yesterday. Here are a list of mutations on the left. The ones in red are these difficult ones, leading to discordant results. Then you see the number that were tested. And then uh, if we jump to the right, you see that these difficult ones, the midget doesn't recognize them as resistant. Whereas in LJ, most of them are recognized as resistant, except the 572 phenylalanine is a difficult one also in LJ. And if we then do MIC testing in LJ, where the critical concentration is uh, 40 microgram per ml, you see that um, these tend to have very high MICs, <coughs> although for these difficult ones, it's variable. It sometimes is only 80, but all the way up to 640 microgram per ml. And then testing a, a bunch of different uh, rapid DST methods, you can see that um, the midget Overall, on a panel of these difficult mutations, about five uh, bacteria per mutation, uh, the sensitivity of midget overall was only 7% in recognizing them as resistant. But if we then force the machine to keep the tube and read out longer, you can see that after time, uh, these strains did tend to show resistance. And the key is that the the control tube without antibiotic just, just manages to grow within the 12-day window. So you think it's a valid susceptible result, but the resistant uh, strain needs a little bit longer in the antibiotic containing medium tube to show itself as resistant. The recessorin microtiter assay also uh, performed <coughs> poorly on these. Nitrate reductase assay a little bit better. The MOTS also missed most of them. Thin layer agar method, I'm not going into details of these different rapid testing methods, uh, performed quite well. And then the Hein NTBDR plus version 2 also missed, missed a number of them. We know that the 572 mutation is not included in the RRDR covered by genotypic methods. 
and the expert did okay except for uh, low numbers of bacteria with the 533 mutation were missed as resistant. And again, the 572 is not included in the expert neither. So uh, with regards to phenotypic versus genotypic testing, the original uh, validation studies for the expert and the Hein uh, line probe assay said that they were not fully specific because there was false resistance detected and uh, led to a poor uh, positive predictive value. But in hindsight, we think that it's actually the poor sensitivity of phenotypic methods for these disputed mutations that was interpreted wrongly. So overall, we think the genotypic methods are more sensitive. They have their own problems. These rare mutations outside of the RRDR are not covered, as I mentioned. Uh, the expert misses some of the 533 prolines and Hein misses a few more. <coughs> the problem with the expert is if you have minority populations that are resistant, uh, that they are missed in expert. You have to have more than 80% <coughs> mutant DNA for the expert to say this is resistant. And this is an advantage of the Hein, which can already detect uh, mutant populations as low as 10%. <coughs> So are these important? Um, as for the other drugs, what's the clinical relevance of these mutations? They are not rare and they confer a poor prognosis. So if you, th in the olden days when the gold standard was phenotypic resistance testing, um, RPOB gene was only sequenced after a strain was found resistant in phenotypic methods. So then you tend to find the high confidence mutations, the 531. But if you do an unbiased analysis directly on sputum without doing a culture selection and phenotypic DST first, you find that depending on the geographical region, 10 to 50% of these mutations are uh, these disputed difficult ones. And there's geographic variation and it may also depend on prior treatment history. So in Bangladesh, the standard category one first line treatment outcome is equally poor for these disputed difficult mutations as for the high confidence mutations, uh, but it may be different in high income settings. This is on the frequency you see in different settings, Hong Kong, Kinshasa, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, without prior phenotypic selection. You see that at the bottom, there's a range of frequency of these disputed difficult mutations from 11% to as high as 54%, although those are small numbers, uh, constituted by these difficult ones. I hope this slide is um, legible. Um, this is the treatment outcome of patients with these different levels of resistance. At the top, you see the high level rifampicin resistance, the common mutations, the high <coughs> confidence ones. And as an example, um, <coughs> The 531 leucine mutation with 155 patients, 83% had an unfavorable outcome on first line therapy, and that <coughs> included failure or relapse in 65%. And then the ratio of failure to relapse was high, suggesting that these patients failed category one treatment while on therapy. But if you look at the disputed mutations, for instance, the 511 proline, uh, of 15 patients, 90% had an unfavorable outcome, 75% of those were failure or relapse, and <coughs> the ratio of failure relapse was lower, suggesting that they may respond to category 1 treatment initially, but have a higher rate of relapse. So what happens in high income settings? In Germany, there was a laboratory study where they concluded that there was no influence on treatment outcome, but that they based that on no second isolates being sent to the laboratory. There was no patient follow-up. So uh, we think that the evidence was a little bit weak. In New Zealand, they tested uh, 94 isolates that in midget were shown isoniazid resistant rifampicin susceptible uh, for RPOB mutations and found four of these 94 with the disputed mutations. And all of those four patients had poor outcome and one was only uh, diagnosed after death. So what's the epidemiological importance of these mutations? Uh, they do have increased public health impact. 
Uh, because they're easily missed by the lab, these patients are not recognized in time as having rifampicin-resistant TB and continue to receive rifampicin-based therapy, uh, which leads to um, prolonged infectiousness and ongoing transmission, and also losing additional drugs that are no longer protected by ineffective rifampicin. And for instance, the famous Tugela Ferry outbreak in KwaZulu-Natal that got very big before it was detected and controlled, was based on these disputed mutations. So even though we don't have evidence for that, we hypothesized that these patients were not recognized in KwaZulu-Natal, where DST was entirely midget-based as having rifampicin-resistant TB, <coughs> and that allowed that epidemic to spread to such great extent. And also, it was in a setting with a lot of uh, HIV co-infection and these <coughs> weakening mutations that also slow the growth of the bug but are clinically relevant may uh, have an advantage in an immunocompromised population. So they may uh, wreak more havoc in HIV co-infected patients. So this is my last slide. What do we suggest? How do you detect rifampicin resistance? We think that genotypic DST is the best. Um, because it's rapid and it's highly specific. Uh, we think that the RPOB sequence is the gold standard for rifampicin resistance, in addition to this slow proportion method, six-week uh, Lowenstein DST. Uh, the expert and the LPA miss rare mutations and heteroresistance to some extent. And then phenotypic DST modifications, this is incomplete work. If we lower the critical concentration in the midget, and in LJ, uh, the sensitivity <coughs> for detecting <coughs> resistance improves, but we have incomplete data on whether the specificity mm. is preserved. Uh, we can extend the incubation time, so you are no longer talking about rapid DSD, but at 21 days in midget, it detects half of these mutations rather than 7%. Uh, but again, incomplete data on whether that affects the specificity. And uh, sometimes we also uh, use a stronger inoculum for the really difficult growers on LJ um, with a lower, so only one in 10 dilution instead of one in 100. So it, it's um, not completed on whether you can uh, tweak with these tests and preserve specificity, but that's important that that's um, tested further. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Sure yes. Very nice presentation. Have you, have you examined the responsiveness of these oscillates at higher levels of rifampicin? Uh, you mean that if you increase the dose of rifampicin? Yeah, has anybody looked at this in the animals or? Yeah, actually, Arma is uh, conducting a clinical trial on uh, high dose rifampicin with in. Uh, especially this thought that maybe 20 milligram per kilogram can overcome some of these weakened mutations. Uh, we knew that the, the sample size uh, that we had was insufficient to look in new patients as only 1% of uh, new patients in Bangladesh has uh, rifampicin resistance. Um, and that was indeed the setting where half of rifampicin resistance among these 1% were by the 511 proline and these disputed mutations. Um, so it's, um, we know it's safe, as many <coughs> studies have found, 20 milligram per kilogram, but we are underpowered to see <coughs> whether these patients uh, were still cured and without relapse. But that's an excellent question. Uh, I, I wonder if it'd be possible to think about some sort of even international protocol. That would be an excellent idea, and I, I think what we're all keen the awaiting from Martin Bourret and colleagues is how high can we go before doing the definitive clinical trial with shortening? Can we give 100 milligram per kilogram of rifampicin and get away with it, like with penicillin? Because the toxicity doesn't seem to be dose related. So tho that's an exciting, I, I think that uh, rifampicin is the best drug we have and we should uh, maximize its use. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, therefore, we, according to your data, when we have a rifampicin resistant by an expert, but susceptible by, by any conventional method, we should believe in expert. That's why. 
Correct. The second one, any low level resistant to rifampicin probably is clinically relevant. Correct. This is very important for working in the field. Yeah. Because many, many times there are many confusion about this. Yeah. There is a false resistant on the yeah. user spell, no. False resistant probably or the conventional DRT with the data you are giving. No? I do have one question. We do see in drug resistance surveys and elsewhere that if your pretest probability is low, you do have to exclude administrative error, sample switch. Mm -hmm. So confirming with expert on a second sample is a good idea before committing a patient and then trusting the second result. And in addition to that, you have the source of systematic of if you have synonymous mutations, then you could still get systematic false positives. Where so I mean I guess if you have a resistant expert, ideally would be confirmed with sequencing to make sure to exclude that possibility. Yeah, these are we see those very rarely the synonymous mm. mutations, and they will be uh, lessened in the ultra. So I I wouldn't confuse people in endemic areas without access to RPOB sequencing, but it's the cherry on the cake if you can do it. But also on the contrary, when you have rifampicin <coughs> resistant by the conventional method and rifampicin susceptible by inesper, you have to believe always the rifampicin resistant. Exactly. Only the conclusion is always the same. When you have rifampicin resistant for any method, you have to believe. Yes. Probably it's the conclusion. It's a thank yeah. you for that important yes, for point. The for the clinician, this is the message. Yeah. Specificity, also phenotypic testing is excellent. Eh? So for this 572 mutation that's not <coughs> included in the <laughs> experts, we, we best have additional molecular tests because it's also missed in phenotypic tests. Okay, so thank you. Uh, we'll move to the, the last speaker. <laughs> so Kun Andrus, most of you know probably, the, the <coughs> father of Bedapuni, uh, who's awarded uh, European Inventor Award in 2014 and so when I was interested in new drugs Kuhn had better now that I work on low level resistance <coughs> Kuhn is on low level resistance <laughs> so yeah better low level resistance please um, I just want to start with saying that I'm, I'm maybe seen as the father of bedaquiline but it's a big team that works to bring bedaquiline to the patients and of course I have a huge conflict of interest because we developed it, I think. Um, thank you for the invitation to summarize what we know and don't know about uh, resistance to bedaquiline. This first slide uh, shows what we know. When we raise a set of resistant mutants in vitro, about 20% of them is target-based and 80% probably efflux-based. The top... Excuse me? No. Okay. The target-based mutants uh, are ATPE mutants, leading to high MIC increases, and MIC ranges of 0.25 to 4. There is no cross-resistance with uh, clofazamine in this case. The efflux-based ones are due to mutations in RV678, which is a regulator gene regulating the expression of MMPL5, an efflux pump that also effluxes clofazamine, hence the cross-resistance with clofazamine. The MIC increases are lower, uh, the resulting MICs are um, a little bit lower also, but there is an overlap with the other mutations. So by just looking at the MIC, you can't say whether it's a target-based or efflux-based mutation. The target-based mutations have not been seen in clinical isolates so far, but it's early day, of course, and I'm sure that eventually they will show up. The efflux-based mutations have been seen in vitro, in mice and in patients. The third mechanism is more recently discovered. It's PEPQ based. It's a minority of the mutants. Um, the increases in MIC are also lower and they have been isolated in vitro and in mice. <coughs> we are not sure that it's efflux based, but the fact that this also leads to increased MICs for clofazamine suggests that it's also efflux based. Okay, from now on, I'm gonna focus on RV678 mutants. And from now on, I will not call them mutants anymore, but resistance-associated variants. Because as you will see in my presentation, they certainly not always lead to resistance. So RAFs, resistant-associated variants, what is their effect on preclinical and clinical outcome? Perhaps one of the most important questions. Of course, on the clinical side, we don't know much yet, 
but we do have some mouse um, data. This is an experiment that we did a few years ago where we treated mice for four or six months with different drug combinations and then stopped treatment and measured relapses. And you can see that in two groups we were able to isolate RV678 rafts from mice relapsing. But the parallel groups that were continued to be treated for an additional two months were completely treated and did not relapse anymore. So this suggests that these rafts can appear, but they can also disappear upon continued treatment. And actually we have seen the same thing in a few patients, not many. These are the data from C209, a study where all patients got bedaquiline on top of a background regimen. We have 19 patients that had not converted after six months and had paired samples, baseline and post-baseline. 12 of those 19 had increased MICs. All of these 12s had RV678 rafts, so this probably explains <coughs> the increased MICs. And um, some of them indeed had not yet converted at the interim analysis. And by the way, that suggested at that point in time that these rafts were associated with resistance and failure to treatment. But at the final analysis, the proportion of patients that were actually cured was exactly the same between those that had uh, increased MICs at interim or did not have increased MICs at interim. Of course, the numbers here are very low and we know that very low numbers can sometimes play tricks with you as we have seen with the mortality imbalance. Now, um, the effect of these refs on efficacy has been studied in mice. Here we compare uh, the susceptibility of the wild-type H37RV strain for a very low dose of bedaquiline, much lower than the human equivalent dose, uh, for H37RV and three of these refs. And you can see that although bedaquiline has less activity against these refs, there's still certainly some activity left. If we increase the dose to 50 milligram per kilogram, you see the same picture. Uh, there is considerable activity of bedaquiline, but less so than for the wild type strain. We also tried to rescue this efflux based resistance, because these were RV678 mutations, by adding verapamil, a known efflux pump inhibitor. And in contrast to some other investigators, we could not demonstrate uh, a significant effect of the addition of verapamil uh, in this study. Now, you may have noticed, and um, maybe I go back here, in this slide, uh, it's hard to see of course, but in <coughs> there are two patients that had already high MICs at baseline in the, in the green group, the, the group at the top. We were very puzzled by that and both of them had RV678 refs at baseline, so before exposure to bedaquiline. So we were quite interested in that phenomenon and we decided to investigate this by analyzing the prevalence of RV678 rafts in all baseline samples of all our trials. Okay, we had in total uh, 350 isolates or so, and in 82% of them we did not see any raft. Now, that means that in 18% we did see something happening. But just before I come to that, uh, out of these um, 300, no, 285 patients, seven had used clofazamine prior to entering uh, the bedaquiline study, and they had relapsed because there were patients to be treated with bedaquiline. None of these had a RAF in RV678. So I know that people think that prior use of clofazamine automatically leads to resistance to bedaquiline. There's actually no scientific evidence for that. Uh, these RAFs uh, have only been generated with clofazamine in vitro and never in vivo, at, at least to the best of my knowledge. Now, uh, more concerning is the presence of 2% of isolates at baseline that had never been exposed to clofazamine or bedaquiline with high bedaquiline MICs. And in those 2%, we found RV678 rafts. So you would think, okay, we have to screen for RV678 mutations, and if they have one, they are likely to have a high MIC and unlikely to respond to bedaquiline. No, not true, because uh, twice as many uh, isolates also had RAFs, but normal or even subnormal MICs. So the presence of these RV678 RAFs was really not be able to predict the MIC. We even found uh, an even higher proportion, 11%, which is really a high proportion, 
with mutations in the intergenic region. That's the region where the RV678 protein would bind to. And this the, the mutation there, uh, represented by the star in my image here, that, uh, that mutation apparently increases the susceptibility for bedaquiline. So in 10% of the patients, we have a mutation that increases the susceptibility for bedaquiline. And in some cases, we have double <coughs> mutations, RV678 and the intergenic region. So this makes the story very complex, as you can imagine. Uh, these are all the refs we have seen so far in clinical isolates. And from this picture, you can, of course, conclude that the great variety of these REFs uh, will is makes it very problematic uh, to develop a rapid genotypic DST test, especially because there's <coughs> no correlation between these REFs and bedaquiline MICs. Now, we went further, of course, and after <coughs> seeing that there's quite a proportion of MDRTB patients having these REFs, we wondered whether the same would be true for drug-susceptible DB patients. So we got access to the Stefan Niemann's uh, Hamburg data set. There were 934 drug-susceptible isolates in that set, and we found four of them with RV678 drugs. So you can even find it in drug-susceptible DB patients, although at a much lower uh, um, frequency. Then we went on and uh, found out that these REFs do not occur more frequently in treatment experienced uh, MDRTB patients versus newly <coughs> diagnosed MDRTB patients, and no mo not more frequently in pre-XDR and XDR patients versus just plain MDRTB patients. Also, no more frequent in female patients. You would expect that because uh, this efflux pump is supposed to excrete uh, iron capturing proteins. So um, this is a very uh, intriguing story. Uh, we thought that maybe these REFs uh, are being generated by another TB drug, and the frequency data in drugs susceptible TB and MDR TB suggest that it might actually be a first-line drug. We tested one of these mutants against all the TB drugs we could get our hands on, uh, 21 in total, but we found no cross resistance with any other TB drug uh, except clofazamine and bedaquiline. But there was a slight <laughs> signal for rifampicin. There was a borderline MIC increase. It was not statistically significant, but it still caught our attention, especially as we were aware of a paper by a Dutch group, uh, De Knecht, in 2013, who uh, had found that if you expose RIF resistant strains to sub MIC concentrations of RIF, then this leads to an overexpression of this particular efflux pump, MMPL5. So we hypothesized that if this leads to overexpression of this efflux pump, maybe eventually this will lead to a mutation in, in the regulator gene of that efflux pump. And you would have such situation, of course, if you would retreat patients of which you don't know that they're already RIF resistant, and if you would retreat with rifampicin. So we tested this hypothesis, <coughs> and by the way, as been pointed out by Bauke here, uh, the mutation that uh, causes RPOB uh, to mutate is RV667, which is suspiciously very close to RV678. This might be just coincidence, but I just want to point out that they are close together. So to test this hypothesis that rifampicin would be uh, the culprit for um, generating this uh, RV678 refs, <coughs> we tested this hypothesis by uh, doing competition experiments um, with mutants with just the RPOB mutation and mutants with RPOB plus the RV678 mutation, so double mutants, uh, in order to hopefully see that the double mutant had a competitive advantage in presence of low concentrations of rifampicin. Unfortunately, we were not able to show that. Actually, the double mutant had a slight disadvantage versus the single mutant in uh, low concentrations of rifampicin. So uh, where these RV678 RAFs are coming from uh, is still a mystery to me, and I hope some of you may be interested in this because it's very important to find out where they're coming from. Now switching to the risk of acquiring low-level bedaquiline resistance. Uh, first of all, I'm going to show you that that risk is, of course, dependent on um, the weakness of your background regimen. In the clinical study C209, we found uh, 10 to 20 percent of patients, uh, no, 10 to 
yeah, ten to twenty percent of free XDRs and XDR had slightly increased MICs, while only one percent of MDR TB patients uh, developed increased MICs for bedaquiline. Now, this proportion of ten to twenty percent is exactly the same as the proportion uh, found by Peter Sigilski to develop resistance to fluoroquinolones or second-line drugs in MDRTB patients. And by the way, the use of bedaquiline in MDRTB patients completely prevented the, um, the emergence of resistance to second-line injectables or fluoroquinolones, which is of course a good thing. So what you see here is that the proportion of the patients that develop resistance to bedaquiline or other drugs is just shifting from the MDR group to the pre-XDR and XDR group, and that is because the of the addition of bedaquiline. Now my last uh, few slides are about the long half-life of bedaquiline and emergence of RV678 uh, variants. I wondered uh, what would be the effect of this long half-life uh, on uh, the emergence of these mutations. And what you see here is the bedaquiline washout PK profile. So day zero in this slide is the first day the patient goes off bedaquiline. And at that point in time, you have a mean plasma concentration of about 10 times the MIC. And this concentration drops very slowly over a period of two years to about the MIC. So after two years, after stopping the dacrolin, you still have one times the MIC in the plasma. Now you can look at this in two ways, of course, uh, in a positive way and a negative way. Uh, you, can you can, of course, wonder, um, is the efficacy of the really only due to the period where you give bedaquiline to the patient. It's really possible that the efficacy of bedaquiline extends a little bit beyond uh, that period of administration of bedaquiline. But that's not we, uh, what we are discussing here. We are discussing here in which uh, window would we expect a competitive advantage of these RV678 RAFs. Now we know from previous studies uh, published in 2010 by Emma Huitrich that the mutant prevention concentration for uh, bedaquiline is 3 microgram per ml. So at 3 microgram per ml in the lab, you, you can't uh, find any mutants. At 1 microgram per ml, uh, you can find uh, mutations in vitro. So that's the top part of the window, but we were interested to know how low does bedaquiline needs to, needs to drop before you lose the competitive advantage of these RV678 um, rafts. So we again, we did competition <coughs> experiments, comparing uh, the fitness of the wild type strain and a strain with an RV678 RAF in lowering uh, bedaquiline concentrations. Mm. And we found that the lowest concentration still giving a competitive advantage for these RAFs is one fourth of the MIC. So this is actually not very surprising because this has been shown for streptomycin, I believe, also for streptomycin, it has been described that you can select for um, resistant mutants at one fourth of the MIC. Actually, it's, it's exactly the same uh, figure. So this uh, doesn't look good, right? And you would think that <coughs> every patient that uh, is not cured by pedacoline and relapses would have would develop these RV678 rafts, right? Now we don't have much data. Actually, I have only data for two patients. I will show <coughs> you one of them and he did not develop uh, these graphs, and I'm not sure why. So this is a patient of uh, a trial C209. In the green zone, he was treated with bedaquiline. The red dots are the, the times when he was still excreting TB <coughs> bacilli. So you can see that he converted shortly after stopping bedaquiline. At that point in time, he was still continuing with a background regimen. And then he relapsed after about one year, and then he became negative again, and then relapsed again. Uh, after two years. <coughs> so this is the time period of about two years and we have uh, bedaquiline MICs at three time points and at all three time points the bedaquiline MICs are the same. Why is this? I'm not so sure. M this may be due to the fact that the background drugs uh, were still there. Uh, the last six months of this graph uh, is a period of completely uh, treatment-free uh, follow-up. So in conclusion, the risk of low level resistance to bedaquiline is probably highest in early defaulters. And that's my conclusion after looking at the previous slides. Because in early defaulters you still have a huge bacterial load with probably some RV678 mutants there. 
And then when that patient defaults, he, is expo he or she is uh, exposed to these low levels of bedaquiline for a period of two years. Of course, we don't have data uh, for early defaulters, but I urge you to generate those data if you have access to such patients. The risk of low level resistance to bedaquiline <coughs> is, of course, higher in more resistant patients that are not new and not unexpected. The effect of low level resistance on clinical outcome is not clear. In the mouse, it leads to reduced efficacy, and I'm sure eventually we will also be able to sh show that in the clinic, but more outcome data are needed to demonstrate that. And as for the origin of RV678 rafts in patients never exposed to bedaquiline and clofazamine, I hope I generated your interest to investigate this. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of especially these two ladies, Christina and Nela Cook, who generated most of the data, but also all the co-authors on the paper that will come out shortly in journal Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. Thank you. Thank you, Kuhn. Maybe we'll have time for one or two questions. Thank you, Kuhn. Um, and I applaud your uh, ongoing efforts to try to better understand the uh, clinical significance that there is any of uh, the, these RBO678 mutations. But I was curious with respect to the PRQ mutations, if you could give us a sense how, uh, how well any clinical uh, isolates coming from bedaquiline treated patients have been examined for uh, the presence of PEPQ mutations. Okay, thanks for that question, Ari. Um, at the time, we were actually doing most of this. We didn't know yet about PEPQ. Uh, we did investigate the presence of PEPQ mutations in the few, the 2% isolates of MDRTB that had high MICs associated with RV678 rafts, because we thought maybe they have the high MICs because there's a double mutation, PEPQ and RV678. We didn't find PEPQ mutations in those. In the meantime, there has been an effort going on uh, with my colleague, Kone Koniga, and that uh, the data of that effort uh, will be presented this afternoon in a late breakfast session. There they did a uh, whole <coughs> genome sequencing of about 400 isolates, also of patients never exposed to bedaquiline and clofazamine, and they have found PEPQ mutations in those clinical isolates, but also, just as for RV678, spread <coughs> across all, all the <coughs> MICs. So the contribution to high MICs is not clear. Although in vitro, of course, when you introduce the mutation, you do see the MIC going up. So in conclusion, I think we don't know everything about the resistance to bedaquiline. There must be another gene uh, implied um, that can explain all this, but we are not that far. Do you know if there is some linkage between the, uh, uh, the type of the... Type of uh, and tuberculosis strains and this uh, uh, mutation? We investi investigated this. Um, we didn't have um, isolates from all uh, subtypes, but um, for all the subtypes you had, mm -hmm. um, we, we did find it across mm -hmm. all subtypes. The one um, strange thing though was the mutation that leads to increased susceptibility to the backlink was um, um, only seen in the Beijing yeah. isolate. Okay. Science. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we're about we're Beijing. <laughs> 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 okay. what, one more question? So probably we should also uh, close uh, those of you who have no chair and <laughs> 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 who are still there. So <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>